Today on the Orthodox Ethos Podcast, we discuss the Feast of Pentecost, the descent of the Holy Spirit, and the establishment of the Church. The following apolitikion is chanted by Elder Frem of Arizona of Blessed Memory. <laughs> In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Feast of Pentecost. This is what's coming up on Sunday. Very glad that we have an opportunity to prepare you so that you can enter into the feast and understand deeply and walk away benefited spiritually. That's why we go to church. That's why we have the feast. It is actually to enter into the event and to participate in the grace and to walk away changed and transformed. So here on the screen, we have the icon, which we'll talk about the meaning of the icon today. We have the Traparian in English, and we have the Traparian in Greek. So I'm going to read you the Traparian in English. And it's good if you, when you go home, to study the Traparian in English and to study and chant it in Greek, so that when you chant it in Greek, you actually understand what you're chanting. So we just chanted it in Greek. We chanted, Blessed art thou, O Christ our God who has revealed the fishermen as most wise by sending down upon them the Holy Spirit. Through them thou didst draw the world into thy net. O lover of man, glory be to thee. So two things you should take away from here. That, a lot of things actually to take away, but two things I want you to focus on. On this day of Pentecost, we're going to talk about the event, all the what happened momentarily, but the church wants us to focus on two or three things here. Number one, that those simple fishermen became the most wise of all the people in the world, wiser than Solomon, wiser than Aristotle, wiser than Plato, the most wise of all the people, because wisdom comes with experience of the fount of wisdom, who is Christ. So you don't need to be a PhD, like I went and spent years getting my PhD. You don't need that. You don't need to go and study for years and years books. What you need is experience of the Holy Spirit, and you will become most wise. So all the human beings on the face of the earth, no matter how educated or uneducated, no matter how poor or rich, can become most wise, filled with the Spirit, if they come to Christ and they submit themselves to Christ and become his disciple. But not only did they become most wise, it says, through the Holy Spirit working through them, the whole world was drawn into the net. This is the, they're using this figurative net of the fishermen, right? They were fishermen, they took the net. He said at one point, I will make you fishermen of men. You are fishermen of fish, but I will make you fishermen of men and you will catch them into the kingdom of God. You will make them participants in the kingdom of God. And that's exactly what happened. All the world, St. John Chrysostom says 400 years later, he stands in awe and he says, these simple men and these many witnesses throughout the last three to 400 years, the whole world has become disciples of Christ. Only God can do that. We don't have an elite. We don't have a caste system. We don't have people who are gifted with all kinds of uh, magic or something like that. We have simple men who are filled with the Holy Spirit. This is the day in which we celebrate this great miracle, which is also our day, right? This is the feast day for us. 
This is a chanting from Kafsu Kalivi on Mount Athos. You just listen to it in the background. The fathers here are doing their all-night vigil <coughs> for every year they have dedicated to the Holy Trinity. So this Troparian, we need to learn by heart. We chant it before every teaching that we do with the work that I do online. Elder Ephraim, as you heard him chanting, would always chant it before every teaching because this is a prayer as well, not just a memory of a, an event, but it's actually a prayer to God to send down the Holy Spirit upon his disciples. Here we have the contacion of the feast. So we're going to read that as well. You'll hear that on the feast day during the vigil. This is the goes along with the apolitikion or troparion. We also have the contacion, which is the two main hymns of the feast. And what do we hear here? When the Most High came down and confused the tongues, the Tower of Babel. So Pentecost is the reversal of the Tower of Babel. So confusion was brought upon the world because they had decided that they would become like God. They thought in their pride and their arrogance and their blindness, we can build a, a tower and get up to heaven and become Without God, we'll become like God. What, when did that also happen? There's another time in the very beginning of history that that same thing happened without a tower. Adam and Eve. What happened to Adam and Eve? The same devil who came to the Tower of Babel had come to Adam and Eve and said, you can become God without God. This is the perennial temptation throughout all of history, and it's going to happen again. When is it going to happen again? We're just going to see it maybe even in our lifetime or soon, we can see it coming already in the horizon. In the end times, the same lie is told again and again and again. Become God without God. Become like God. Have powers of God. Have power and control. And what we have something called in our day transhumanism. It's, in a, it's a movement here to try to do what only God can do, and that is give eternal life to man through technology. That's another thing that's coming on. So the same temptation in Adam and Eve, they fell, they listened. They said, oh yeah, we can eat without obedience. We can take from the fruit. We can become like God without God. The same thing with the Tower of Babel. We're going to be, but now what happens? God says, we're going to reverse that. The whole point of why, why did he become man? Why did he come and dwell among us? Why did he go through all of this economy, this, this crucifixion, this resurrection, the ascension, all these events? It's for what purpose? To save our souls. But what does it mean? It means to restore us with Pentecost to communion with God. The whole thing leads to Pentecost. This is our, our feast day. Every one of you who've been baptized and chrismated in the church have already received what they received on Pentecost. We've all been participants in the feast of Pentecost. This is our feast. This is the church's feast. This is the Christian's feast. And he comes now and when the same Confusion happened, now he comes to reverse it. And what does the Treparian say? He divided the nations then. He divided the nations then. That's interesting. Do we understand that God puts the, the boundaries of the nations? Did you know that? He put the boundaries. No one else. The Greeks over here, the Italians over there, I don't know what else, right? He divided the nations. But then he's going to unite them again without getting rid of the boundaries, He's going to unite them all together in the descent of the Holy Spirit. But when he distributed the tongues of fire, he called all to unity. So he's reversing the work of the devil. He's bringing it to an end. The division only brings, comes to an end with the Holy Spirit and Pentecost. There are many attempts today to unite all the people together without God. The same old temptation again and again. Therefore, with one voice, we glorify the all Holy Spirit. This is the great hope of our salvation that in the feast and the event of Pentecost, we have unity in Christ. So when you see division of the Christians, the Orthodox, who's behind the division? The devil's behind the division. When you see unity, love, compassion, long-suffering, patience, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, what is this here? Well, in the Old Testament, what is this Pentecost? We have to figure out what Pentecost is before we can figure out what happened on Pentecost. On the Feast of Pentecost, it is 50 days after what event? The passing through the Red Sea, which is the Passover. When do we celebrate? When does the, the new Passover happen? At Pascha, right? We have the, 
The old Passover was passing from Egypt into the promised land, and the, the new Passover, which is the universal Passover of all humanity from death to life, happened with the resurrection. Well, 50 days later, the Lord brings us the Feast of Pentecost. Well, 50 days later then, it was the commemoration and celebration of the reception of the law on Mount Sinai by the prophet Moses. You can see some images here, some icons and some lithographs showing the event which was celebrated on the Feast of Pentecost by the Jews. Well, now we have a new event, a new celebration, far more important, just like the Passover from Egypt to the Promised Land was important for the Jewish people. Well, far more important is the Passover from life to death and resurrection, and far more important than the commemoration of the law is the descent of the Holy Spirit, which replaces the law essentially replaces, doesn't, re, doesn't do away with the Ten Commandments, but it supersedes all of that which has come. And now we don't have to live by the law because we have the Spirit. If you live by the Spirit, you don't need a law. Who needs the law? The people who break the law, right? The people who break the law are the ones that have to have the law apply to them. But if you live by the Spirit, you surpass the law, you live according to the will of God, you have no need. Laws become superfluous because now you're living the new reality of the kingdom. And this is what Pentecost is all about. You see here the images of the descent. This is a Western image, but it's, it's, it's very graphic. And then we have, who is preaching? I'm here. Who is this? Peter. People had gathered together. He's, he's at the, you're going to see that house as it is today. It's been rebuilt many, many years later. Not unlike this. You see the stairs going up to the house. They were in the upper room. They came out and they had, all people gathered together. They heard this big sound that came out of the room, and they were wondering what happened there. And they all gathered together, and then Peter starts to preach. We're going to talk about that in a minute. So let's read from the scriptural passage from Acts. This is Acts 1 to 4. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all of one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues at, like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. We could do a whole thesis on this, but two or three things that I want you to remember. There were certain things that had to happen before the Holy Spirit came down. The Lord told them, the Holy Spirit's coming. Don't leave Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit's going to come. You stay there and pray. And they were praying, and night and day they were praying. They weren't just praying, though. They were doing something that the Lord commanded them to do. What do you think they were doing besides just praying together? There was a, something else far more important than just personal prayer. Communion. Look at what it says here. You, how do I know it's communion? It tells us right here in the Scriptures. What does it say? Well, first of all, they're of one accord. What does that mean, one accord? And one accord means of one mind, one heart. They were harmonious. They weren't arguing. They, did, they all agreed on who Christ was. There was nobody there like Judas. They were of one accord. That's a, what we call a presupposition. In other words, it must be there before the other thing can happen. Very important what I'm telling you right now. All of this is for us and our salvation. This is written down for you and your salvation. Why do we read the scriptures? Because, oh, we're going to remember something that happened 2,000 years ago. No, this applies to us and our salvation. So before the Holy Spirit can descend in your life, you're going to have to have one accord between yourselves, but also with God. You have to have one accord, and that is unity, love, communion, in the one faith, the one faith delivered from the Lord. That is the Orthodox faith. So right here, they're telling us they were confessing the one faith, the one trust in Jesus Christ, and they had the one faith. And they were in one place, but that one place is not simply in one place physically, but they were in one place. That's a, in Greek, this is a phrase used by the fathers Epito afto, it says in Greek. And we know that that actually means the Eucharist. You might say, well, how do we know that? Well, we know that from all the writings of the fathers, that this was a phrase, to epito afto, is 
they're doing, not just in one place, but they're doing something all together, and that is the Eucharist, their divine liturgy. Every single day the apostles were gathering and they were having the Eucharist, just like today in the monasteries around the world. So they were of one accord, they were in the Eucharist, that was, they were the church manifested, and then the Holy Spirit came. So what does that mean for us? We need to do the same thing if we want to acquire the Holy Spirit. We need to be all together in the same faith and in the Eucharist, and that is how we're going to become worthy of the Holy Spirit. And then it says here that it says there was a came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. Was it a mighty wind? No, it was like a mighty wind. Just like when we celebrated a couple of days ago the Ascension, and it said that he went up in a cloud. Was it actually a cloud with water from water, or was it like a cloud? It was like a cloud. It was like wind. In other words, they're trying to describe a spiritual event with physical descriptions, but it's a, it's a spiritual reality. And then it says, And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as unto fire. But it, was it fire? Was it like actual fire on their heads? We see here in the icon that they have that depicted, but it's not fire. What do we need fire in our heads for? It's the Holy Spirit, like fire, all right? And then all of that, what's the point of it all? Is it just for them that they can celebrate that and they can say, I'm a Christian and you're not, and we're better than you. Why did the Lord send the Holy Spirit? Well, you can see here, it goes on and it says, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak. They didn't, it didn't end with this. We don't go to church in order to go home and say, okay, I'm fine, I'm saved. But what do we go? To speak, to witness, to preach, to teach, for the sake of all of our neighbors and our friends. Do you know that if you have love, you want to give love away? If you have love and you don't give it away, you don't really have love. If you have love of God, you must also have love of your neighbor. These two things are inseparable. So the apostles began to speak. What did they begin to speak? With other tongues. Why? Why was it necessary for them to speak other tongues? What does it mean, other tongues? Other languages. Do you know that there are some people, I was going to show you the video, but it'll go too long. It's very strange. I saw it today for the first time. There were these, I don't know, some kind of Protestants or something, and they were celebrating what they thought to be Pentecost. And they were talking in all kinds of strange languages nobody understood. Is that what happened on Pentecost? No. What's the whole point? Again, the whole point is for them to speak. To speak what? The words of salvation, the gospel, to preach the gospel. And there were people in those days because it was, again, the Feast of Pentecost. Jews had come from all over the Mediterranean to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast. And they were people from, as we're going to see in a minute, all over. And so they began to speak in other languages precisely to bring that gospel which had been, up until that moment, the treasure of the Jews to all the nations. But most Christians today are not Jews because they went and they preached to all the world. And the Jews who were his disciples, the apostles were Jews. Did you know that the apostles were Jews? Did you know that our Lord was a Jew? Yes, they were Jews. They were, in other words, Hebrews, people, the line of David. But they understood that they were at a treasure that they were going to give away to the world. It wasn't just for them. And this is what happened on the day of Pentecost. The time had come now for all of that truth and goodness and beauty to be spread abroad to the whole world. And the Lord arranged everybody to come together and then to become baptized on the day. Let's see what that's all about. We're going to see in a second here. Before we get to that, I want to say one other thing about this. So let's just repeat here, summarize, because I say a lot of stuff and then people forget the, the most important. Here is a beautiful icon, ancient icon here. The Holy Spirit that Christ had promised his disciples came on the day of Pentecost. Again, it's throughout the Old and New Testament, we have the promise of the Holy Spirit coming to the people. The apostles received the power from on high. This power from on high is the presence of the Holy Spirit. Do you know that if you are a Christian and you are purified and illumined, in within you, you have power, spiritual power. Anyone who lived along saints like Elder Ephraim saw the power of God in the, in the fishermen of today, right? The simple 
fisherman of souls that Elder Ephraim was. He ran around the ro- around, went around the world with a little compaschini, but he had unbelievable power, his prayer and his love. So they were sent power from on high. It's of God. God is the one who works through all the saints. And they began to preach and bear witness to Jesus as the risen Christ, the King and Lord. This moment has traditionally been called the birthday of the church. So we don't celebrate traditionally in the Orthodox Church many birthdays. Anybody know which birthdays we celebrate in the Orthodox Church? Christ's birthday. What else? What other birthday we celebrate? Panagia's birthday. One more? There's only one more. St. John the Foreigner. We celebrate three birthdays because they all have to do with our salvation. Otherwise, no birthdays. What do we celebrate for all the saints? All the other saints have the day we celebrate, not their birthday, when they died, because they don't die. That's the mystery of this whole thing. All of this is so that we don't die. So what happens when they die and they don't die? They are born into eternity. That's their birthday. That's our birthday. When we're born, one could say when we're born in the baptistry is our birthday, but also when we're born, when we die, we're born into eternity, right? So that's the day we celebrate for everybody else. Now, if we become saints, and that's the whole point of our life, to become saints, but we also celebrate the birthday of the church, which is our, that's also our birthday, because when we're baptized and chrismated, we celebrate Pentecost, which is the birthday of the church. We, we are all participants in that same event through the mysteries of the church. All right. Now let's go on to the rest of the text. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue? wherein we were born, Parthians and Methus and Elamites, and dwellers of Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia, in Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, in Egypt and in parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome and Jews and proselytes, Cretus and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. So this was the whole point of Pentecost. One of the main points of Pentecost is that now, as we said, the gospel is going to be preached throughout the whole world. And what happened was immediately, as we said earlier, Peter was preaching to the many, many people. These are different older depictions of the apostle Peter preaching. And there were 3,000 men baptized in that day. 3,000. It's pretty unique. And in those days, that was a lot of people because Jerusalem wasn't that big, right? Today, today we have massive cities, but back then the cities were not that big. They were a couple tens of thousands, 100,000 maybe, it depended. But so 3,000 immediately were baptized from all over. So immediately what happened was they left after the feast and they took the gospel to the four corners. We, we, saw, we saw all over the known world at the time, the places that would become bastions of the Christian faith. So this is the Apostle Peter. We have an icon from the 5th or 6th century, very close to what he would have looked like. We have a tradition coming down. This has been the way we've depicted him ever since. And here's another image of him preaching to the people on the edge of the upper room. Now we're going to talk about this upper room. This is the way it looks today. If you went to Jerusalem, that's what you would go to visit and venerate. Is that, is that building from the days of the apostles? It's not actually. It's been rebuilt because there's been wars. Persians came and destroyed it. But it is very old. It's probably 800 years old, this building right here. And it is built on the same spot and in a similar way than it would have been in the days of our Lord. So this is where not only Pentecost, but the mystical supper and other events happened in this location, in this upper room. And so we also have it in scripture. We read in Luke, it says, and tell the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished. Prepare it there. And that upper room became the center of the church of Jerusalem. It became the place where they prayed night and day. It became the, became the place where they experienced the resurrection and the Pentecost 
and then were uh, the, became eventually a church uh, and was dedicated to that place ever since. They would call this place, as they called the whole church in Jerusalem, Zion, mother of all the churches. This place right here is the mother of all the churches all over the world. That's where it all started. That's where your life in Christ started because that's where Pentecost was, right? What is the meaning of the icon? So you see the icon, you venerate the icon. You ever stop and think, what does all this mean? Why? Am, what is the point of this here? So we have the position of the, of the apostles, and what is it telling us? One of the things it's telling us is it's the harmony and the equality of the apostles. That's one thing. The apostles are all equal. We don't have a pope over the other apostles. That's a heretical teaching that some in the West have bought into. They're all equal. Why are they all equal? What makes them equal? In this event, did anybody get more Holy Spirit than the other ones? The Holy Spirit is what makes you a disciple. The Holy Spirit and his dwelling is what makes you uh, a person of Christ, a disciple of Christ. So they all had that. The minute that they all have it, they're all equal and they all are, are brothers in Christ. There's, this is a harmonious picture here. There's no discord. When did we have discord? Remember, we had discord when the Lord came and confused the tongues in the Old Testament. Now we have harmony and unity in the, in the image. And then also this, these towers here in the back, they could remind us of the Tower of Babel, which has now been done away with. We also have the Apostle Paul. In the, in the icon right here. Was the Apostle Paul present in the day of Pentecost? Where was the Apostle Paul the day of Pentecost? Well, he probably had started or about to start persecuting the church. Why is he in the icon? What do you guys think? He became a saint. He became a great apostle. And so they want to say, by including him in this image, they want to say that he is a participant in the reality of Pentecost, and he is at one and harmonious with all the apostles. He did the work of Pentecost. And then also we see in the middle, there's an empty space. What does that mean? Anybody think? What does it say? Read that for me, someone, Andreas. What does it say there? Number five. Equidai is where Christ sits, whom God must so very much different than what the so-called Roman Catholics teach. What do the Roman Catholics teach? That he is the person who stands in the place of Christ, Peter. They say, we're the disciples of Peter. We're in the place of Christ. But we say, no, Christ is in our midst. He's always with us. And he always will be our only head and our only guide. And he will always uh, be with the church until the end of time. What's this? This guy in the middle here, have you seen this, this fellow here? It's a symbol of the world, o cosmos. That's the Greek word for world. Even though in the very, very ancient icons, uh, there is, the crowd is depicted underneath them, it was replaced very quickly with this personification of the whole world. And this is what a 17th century description says about this person here in the middle of the icon. The man sits in a dark place since the whole world had formerly been without faith. He is bowed down with years, for he, has been, he was made old by the sin of Adam. Right? He's an old man. He's not a young man. His red garment signifies the devil's blood sacrifices. Right? They had, the devil had encouraged all the pagans to offer blood sacrifices and to appease the gods, the demons, in other words. So, that is the symbolism of his red garment. The royal crown signifies his sin, which ruled the world as a tyrant, the world before Pentecost, before Christ, and everyone who does not participate in Pentecost, they are under the tyranny of the passions, the tyranny of death and sin. The white cloth in his hands with the 12 scrolls means the 12 apostles who brought light to the world through their teaching. So very interesting and educational when you see the icon now, you can understand all of this imagery. Now, very interesting also, the icon tells us the following according to a very great iconographer, Leonid Uspensky, who says, the icon of Pentecost is an image of the inner life of the church. How so? It shows that Christ 
sits at the head of our church, invisibly guiding us. We have descended directly from the apostles. We have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit by God through the apostles. We celebrate our own participation in Pentecost through chrismation and the mysteries of the church because those things transcend time and space. On Sunday, when we celebrate the feast, are we disconnected or connected to all of those around the world who are celebrating the feast? We're connected. How are we connected? Because the event of Pentecost is outside time and space. When we celebrate it on Sunday, when we go to the divine liturgy, it's an eternal event. We don't go to the church down the road. We go to heaven. That's where it is being celebrated. The divine liturgy happens in heaven. You may go there and leave, or I may go there and leave and not understand that. That doesn't change the reality. People who enter into that reality, they attest to it. And we have many saints who walked with saints and angels in the divine liturgy. This event, because it is God who is take, bringing it about, is timeless. And there, therefore, we enter in just as they did. God, but my, listen to this, very important. God is not a respecter of persons. What does that mean? He doesn't say, oh, I like Mary and John more than Peter and George. So I think I'll give... Only the apostles participated in Pentecost. All you other people, you're second-class second, second class citizens. That, that's not what God does. He allows everyone throughout all of history to participate in the same spiritual event. It is a timeless event that we enter into. Very, very important. While we always work toward harmony and unity with one another, we have a diversity of gifts and talents, and there's no forced uniformity very important in the orthodox church we respect each individual personality we don't force you into some kind of cookie cutter reality right that's what this pentecost is about here there's 12 different apostles with 12 different personalities and they're all have the holy spirit we're not gonna no one should be forced to become something you have to love jesus on your own you have to love christ and then you fulfill the great calling of the Christian. No forced uniformity. People of all nations, tribes, and tongues are united together in the new spiritual building of the church that transforms us from being lowly earthly creatures to heavenly ones. The Orthodox Church is not just for Greeks or for Russians or for Romanians or for whatever. The Orthodox Church is for every human being. This is what this feast screams to the whole world, that the Orthodox faith is for every human being of every background, of every stage, of every level, whatever you want to call it, this is what the Great Feast of Pentecost is about. Pentecost is called an apocalyptic day, which means the final, the day of final revelation. Are we waiting for a new revelation after Pentecost? There's a big religion right around the corner here that says there was a new revelation later on. The Mormons. What do the Mormons teach? You should know what the Mormons teach. You're going to be meeting Mormons throughout your life. You need to know your faith and you need to know what they teach. You know what they teach? That Jesus Christ came to America. He appeared here and he preached another gospel. The Book of Mormon records all of this preaching of Jesus Christ in America. Did you know that they teach they taught that? They teach a lot of other things that are very strange. And there are millions because a, their founder, Joseph Smith, had a vision of an angel who revealed this to him in 1830 something, all right? So it is very important that you understand that we're not waiting for any other revelation. It's all done. Now we're waiting for one thing to happen. What is that? The second coming. We're waiting for Jesus Christ to come back to judge the living and the dead. And we'll see him in the heavens. Do not look around for other prophets. Do not look around for other people who are going to be like Christ or talk about as if they're a Christ. Only from heaven, the sign of the cross will come. That's the only way. So this is it. Everybody who wants to be a Christian enters into this event. There's no other events we're waiting for. This is it. It is also called an eschatological day, which means the day of the final and perfect end. For when the Messiah comes and the Lord's day is at hand, the last days are inaugurated. When did the last days begin? Pentecost. The end times began with Pentecost. That's what we just read. From the beginning of the church's work in the world... On the day of Pentecost, we enter the end times. We are all living in the end times. Now, there are the end times of the end times that are talked about in the book of Revelation. 
But all of the period from the first coming to the second coming are called the eschata, the end times. And so that's why the Apostle John says somewhere in his epistle that the Antichrist already is among us. There's already many Antichrists, he says, because the same reality they lived in the first century, we're living in the 21st century. The same basic reality. Nothing has changed. Now, things get worse and there's the degrees of difference, but basically it all begins. And what happened, it says in, in, in the Old Testament, it said, there's a prophecy that says, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. That, was, that happened and was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. And from that point forward, we're in the end times. That's when these, this prophecy will be fulfilled. So the apostle Paul, Peter, when he preaches, remember when he's standing on the on the, root, on the stairs there, he's preaching and he re refers to this prophecy being fulfilled. In the end times, he says, this will be fulfilled. And he says, this is the day of the fulfillment. On Pentecost, his spirit is being poured out upon all flesh and all of us are now, uh, have a direct participation in the divine trinity, the divinity of God. So it says here, in many places in scripture that we now become temples of the Holy Spirit. What, one of the main reasons why the church says you must remain pure, you must avoid things that are going to corrupt you, you must avoid that which is going to distort you and pollute you, is because you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. And the things that you do with your body corrupt and chase away the Holy Spirit. So when you do sin and other things that are contrary to the will of God, it's not just that you do something bad to yourself. You're actually driving away the presence of the Holy Spirit. This is what happened and was given on Pentecost. And this is why we, we have such a responsibility as Christians. We have such a gift. And it says here, we by our own membership in the church have received the seal of the gift of the Holy Spirit in the sacrament of chrismation. And therefore, Pentecost has happened to us. Everybody here who is a Christian has been chrismated and therefore has the Holy Spirit.